So take a look around. What do you have that God hasn't given you? Every heartbeat, every breath, every good and perfect gift comes from Him. He is the ultimate giver. He literally gives us gifts that we can't comprehend. Think about this. There are more electrical impulses generated in one day by a single human brain cell than by all the telephones in the world. <laughs> or how about the fact that food tastes delicious? It didn't have to taste delicious. It could have all tasted like kale, but no, it's fantastic. We plan our day around good tasting food. God gave us this. And then there's our health. We're not healthy because we deserve it. We didn't jump in a 55 gallon drum of yogurt and spinach. Our health is a gift, a gift that is too often taken for granted. God has always given to me knowing that he would get little in return. He is a father that enjoys giving good gifts to his children. I've heard it said that it's possible to give without loving, but you can never love without giving. And that is his example. For God so loved the world that he gave. Like most people, I'm often driven by what I don't have when I should be driven to seek the heart of God. Because God's heart is revealed in his generosity. Maybe my heart is too. Would you pray with me? Good Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and your gracious, graciousness and the generosity that you have given each and every one of us, Lord, by loving us and sending your Son we pray, Father God, that as we open up your word, that your Holy Spirit would speak, speak through it, and, and lead it and guide it into the places our hearts need to hear it most, Father. We pray this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, well, there's a lot to be grateful for, amen? amen. So many things. Actually, a fr friend, Chizoba, Chizoba, can you raise your hand? Yeah, Chizoba actually came to me in the service, and he says, hey, I just wanted to be able to share, I just wanted to be able to share, you know, that aren't you grateful to be alive, Amen. Grateful that God has given us breath and how that should inspire us, how that should inspire us to worship this God who's given us breath. I'm thankful for faces that I, I don't normally get to see here. I see the, the crabs in the back, our missionaries in Dominican. Can you guys wave your hands? Make sure you flood them right after the service, ask them how they're doing, all that stuff. I'm thankful, I'm grateful for my cousin Ray, who traveled up from Dallas. He's headed up to Michigan. This is my cousin Ray. Can you raise your hand? Ray knew me when. Don't ask him a lot of questions when I was, about, when I was younger, please. So uh, Ray knew me when, and uh, so a blessing to have you, Ray. Um, I'm thankful and grateful for this last summer because this has been a summer of transition, crazy transition. And some of you have experienced some of those same transi transitions, graduations, right? Maybe you've been to some weddings. I've been to a couple myself. Um, I decided in the middle of all that, it'd be a great idea to sell our house. That would be cool. We had a transition as a church that we walked through together with, with our worship and discipleship pastor in Reagan, Washington, as God was calling them to plant a church in Colorado. That's been a heavy transition for us, hasn't it? And uh, for us, every step of the way, whether it was the weddings or the graduations or with, with the Washingtons or buying and selling a house, we've been grateful to see God's people come alongside, the church just kind of rise up together and support and to champion one another. Amen? It has been, it's been beautiful to see and to be a part of. And, and over and over, I thought, just in my own personal walk, this Lord, the Lord has brought this scripture to me out of 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. It says, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And here's the response, our response. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with, with words or speech, with, with actions and with truth. And all God's people said. So generosity, living a generous life. Um, I, I've seen it, in, and as a matter of fact, you see it in the life of Jesus. Jesus was generosity personified. He was generosity in the flesh. Think about, just for a moment, different stories you know about Jesus and how he interacted with people and how, how when he encountered folks, he had, he had all the power, all the majesty, all of the glory, all of the comfort, and he laid it all down in order to come to earth, to sacrifice his life in order that we might be rescued from our sin and have the promise of eternal life in heaven. And not just in Jesus' life. This is the MO of God all throughout the Bible. God is a God who is generous in his actions, generous in his giving, because he has this deep, 
abounding love and care for, for all of his creation. And we see that we're not only the glad recipients of his generosity, God also calls us to be the givers, the, to express generosity back towards other people. We heard last week when Pastor Reagan preached that sermon that we were blessed to be a blessing. You remember that? Say that with me. Blessed to be a blessing. One more time. Blessed to be a blessing. Well, this is an extension of, of that truth, that God has, has called us to be blessed, but also to be a blessing to other people, and that we do this by making a decision to, to really pursue the idea of living generously, of being people of generosity, that really identified the early Christian church. And really, generosity is something that a lot of people are inspired by, what a lot of people would try to you know, want to attain in their life. If you were to ask some random people, I would say probably everybody in church this morning, if you were to ask random people on the street, do you want to be identified as a generous person, a person of generosity, most all of them would say yes. In fact, the majority of them. There's been a study by a group called the Science of Generosity back in 2016 out of Notre Dame. And they actually polled people. They, they just went out and they asked people, do you want to be identified as a generous person? And two-thirds of Americans, two-thirds of Americans said, yes, I'd like to be identified. 326 million Americans in the population right now, and 217 million of those Americans said, yes. I believe generosity is, is a positive thing, and I would like people to see me as being generous. And, and this, is, this is not a church statistic. This is a, a statistic that is true for religious and non-religious people. This is a strong value, a strong virtue that inspires a lot of people inside and outside of the church. Perhaps it's what inspired this 67-year-old carpenter named Russell E. Herman. Now, some of you might know that name. It's a story that comes back to the St. Louis area back in 1994 when Russell E. Herman actually passed away. He lived on the east side of the river in East St. Louis. And in Russell's last will and testament, he left, ready? He left this staggering amount of money. Let me, let me lay out just a few of them. $2 billion to the city of East St. Louis. Another $1.5 billion to the state of Illinois. Well spent, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> $2.5 billion to the national forest system, right? And to top it all off, listen to this, he left $6 trillion to the federal government to help pay off the national debt. I mean, you look at that and you think, wow, what an amazing act of generosity, except for one problem. Herman's only asset at the time of his death was a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> That's all he had to his name, Russell E. Herman desired and longed to have an identity of someone that was living generously, but when it came to brass tacks, he wasn't actually generous at all. There was nothing behind it. So you hear John's words, dear children, let us not love with words and with speech alone, but with actions and in truth. And that's a, really, I think, the tension for all of us. I don't think Russell E. Herman is alone. I think there's a tension for all of us that we admire generosity. We are inspired by it. We want to attain gener generosity, but at the same time, maybe we've never taken the serious steps to actually becoming the generous people that we admire in this world. Maybe you don't even know where to start, and that's what this series about is all about, living generously it's about capturing the idea, studying biblical principles and looking at passages in different places where Christ was teaching and God was revealing himself to his people. But to look at scriptures and say, there are, are principles and steps that God has called us to take in order to be and to live generous lives. Now, when we begin to think about generosity, you probably think, well, Carl, you're going to begin to challenge our thinking on money and possessions. It's true. On our time, our resources, but beyond that, also relationships. And that's that's all true. And you can begin to think, well, generosity sermon series, um, financial sermon series, this is going to be about what God wants to take from me. And listen, when God calls us to live generously, it's, it's not primarily about what he's wanting to take from us. It's about helping us to discover what God has for us if we're willing to let go of the little thing that we've been guarding and shielding and protecting in order for God to give us something greater. Amen? It's about discovering what God has for us. And so we're going to do that over this week and the next four weeks. We're going to look at some, some principles. Next week, we're going to talk about the principle of the first fruit. And then we're going to talk about the principle of the treasure. 
Then we're going to talk about the principle of the harvest. And then we're going to close with the principle of the storehouse. But today we're, we're focusing in on the principles, principle of, the, of, of ownership and, and stewardship. Ownership and stewardship. That's where we need to begin because this is the very first step or the very, the very um, ground floor, floor building block that we need to start. The principle of ownership and stewardship. When we think of ownership, let's look at that first. There are a few passages that come to mind. I wonder if you'll read a couple of them with me. Will you read Psalm 24:1 with me? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Now Psalm 89:11, read that with me. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. And let me read let me read Psalm 50. It says, this is the Lord speaking through David. And so David's recording what what God is saying to his people. He's saying to his people, I have no need of a bull from your stall, or goats from your pens. For every animal in the forest is what? Mine, says the Lord. The cattle on a thousand hills. When people say God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, it comes from Psalm 50. He says, I know every bird in the mountains and every the insect in the fields are mine. Now, you might think, God, you could have all the bugs. I don't want them. They're, they all are yours. You can take possession of them. So, so ownership comes up, and what we see here is, is God, God doesn't need anything. Very clearly, in this, these passages, just three, and the scriptures are replete with the fact that God is, is self-sufficient, he's self-existent, he's omnipotent, he has everything he needs. And it's important that we, we pause for a moment and not rush through that reality. I know it sounds familiar to you. I know you may already find yourself in agreement with it, but, but it's a foundational principle in understanding how to live generously, that God is the owner of everything. He's owner of it all, all of your resources, all of the land, all the possessions of everything. It's all his. And this is true for those who maybe feel like they don't have much and those who feel like they maybe have an abundance. King David, who wrote those Psalms, and the height of his power, standing before his people and as they're giving an offering back to the Lord, David said this in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this. Speaking to the Lord, he says, everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. Can you imagine that? God, what we're giving back to you is, is something that you've already given us. We're only giving back what you've already given to us. David, David knew his position, that God was the owner, that he owned it all because he created it all and it all belonged to him. And I, I especially like the fact that he says, and all who live in it. Because it, it gives us another dimension of stewardship. That stewardship isn't, isn't just about stuff. It isn't about material possessions. Stewardship is really, it's really, really about lives. It's about people and how God calls us to interact with people. All who live in it, they all belong to God. And God wants to be good stewards with the relationships that we were a part of. That means every person that's come into existence is meant to bear the image of God. Whether they realize it or not, or whether you realize it or not, they were meant to bear the image of God, and God sees them as his. Every person that you go to school with, every person that comes to youth group or you see out in the mall is, is created to bear the image of God, whether you like them or not. Every person that you, you pass on 270 or that cuts you off on 270 was created to bear the image of God, whether, whether you believe it or not. Every spouse, husband, wife, every child, created to bear the image of God, whether you see it or not, whether you want to believe it or not. Every person that you just want to unfollow on Facebook because they drive you crazy, still created in the image of God to bear his image, whether we see it or not. God has created them with this beautiful intrinsic value. He sees them as his. And stewardship is not about the possessions. That we, it's also about the people that God has created and that he owns that are his. And God has expectations on, on how we steward those relationships. Just like we have expectations on how we steward the stuff that we feel like belongs to us. How many of you have ever been on an airplane a train, anybody? Raise your hand. Only three of us. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah most people have. And you probably, at the time that you went, you, you probably either had a, a check-in bag, maybe a few, 
or a carry-on that you put in the bin. And here's the thing, you came in with your bag, your stuff, and as you put it in the bin or in the cargo area, probably a steward maybe helped you out or a stewardess helped you out. And, and even though they did that, you knew the whole time that even though it was out of your possession for a time for that flight or for that train ride, that that, that stuff that, that was yours, that was important to you, that it still belonged to you, a steward might have had it for a little while, but you know it's still yours. You remain in possession of it. You're the owner. And when it's returned to you, you have expectations. You have expectations that it won't be ripped open, <laughs> that nothing inside of it will be broken or tore apart. You have expectations. I'm not saying it always works out that way. Some of you have traveled enough to realize that's not necessarily the truth. But, but you have expectations and listen, God does too, especially with all that he owns and especially those who live in this world that he created and owns. He wants us to know that the people, the lives that we intersect with are infinitely more important than the carry-ons that we have getting on to some train or plane. People, you have, you have beautiful value to the Lord. Living generously in this pursuit, not to just be identified, but to actually personify generosity. Um, it, it starts with changing our assumptions about ownership and, and stewardship. It starts with changing the assumption that, that, that we are not the owners, that all of it belongs to God. All of our possessions, all of our gifts, all of our talents, all of our relationships and resources, they belong to God. Now, in the realm of money, oftentimes, or the preachers say, there's good news and bad news. The good news God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. God has all the money he needs. The bad news is, is it's in your pocket. That's the bad news. And that's where we find a little bit of tension. That when we think, okay, God, you're the, you're the owner, but at the same time, I seem to have possession of it, and, and I'm wrestling, I'm struggling with that. Peter says, with the things that God has given us, understand he's given them to us because he loves us, and he has expectations. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve who? Others. Whatever gift you received. He says as what? As faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And then he lists out some different various forms we're called to be stewards. He says, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so as with the strength that God provides. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You see... Peter has this understanding of stewardship that, that really doesn't translate so well for us today. We might call a steward a manager, right? There might be an owner of a business, but then there's a manager that's placed in charge. The manager understands that he doesn't own it, but he does manage the affairs. This was true in ancient times, not just for businesses, but really for households that, that really were the, the family business, farms and different things like that. And so when the master would travel away in these ancient times, he would appoint a steward, and that steward would manage all of the affairs of the household. Even sometimes when the, the master was present in the household, the steward would continue to manage. And at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, there would be some type of review where this steward, this manager, would have to give an account of what he did with the manager's or with, this, with the master's money with the master's resources, maybe how he interacted with the master's other workers and servants, he would have to give an account as a steward representing the master. And there was always this clear line of delineation. The, the, the owner knew he owned everything, and, and the steward never forgot that he was simply managing what, what the master owned. It's really clear. And, and here Peter... Peter gives us this, this command to be that, that steward of God's possessions. He says, be faithful stewards of the gifts that God has given you in various forms. And I find it beautiful that he, he shows us it's just not about stuff. He says, with, with your words. How many of you think I, I probably could be a better steward with some of the things that I say? I, I think oftentimes with, with, my, with my children or with my, with my wife. Things will come out of my mouth too hastily. And they'll be sharp, and they'll be cutting, and they won't be glorifying to the Lord, and they won't be edifying to the people that I love the most. And I wish I, wish I could take that back. And the truth is, I've not been a good steward oftentimes with my words. He says, a good steward with your actions. 
A good steward with action. How many you think, man, I could be a, a better steward with my, with my time? Sometimes I can get caught looking at Facebook for far too long when I could be devoting my energies and my time, my actions, in a way that's more glorifying to, to the Lord, to God. And then he says your strength. You know, use the strength that God provides, a steward of, of your body, your physical body, to be able to do things all for a reason, from your words, your actions, your strength, all for the purpose of glorifying God, of people seeing Jesus. You hear that? That people would see Jesus and his glory and honor and power forever and ever. There's a tension in us. We understand, okay, God, you're the owner, hypothetically, and I'm the steward, hypothetically, but it certainly feels like maybe I, I, I'm the majority shareholder in this. So there's a tension in us that, that really practically in real time, it's hard for us to, to live out. We're like that little boy coming into church with his mom and dad, and mom and dad said, here's, here's two quarters, two quarters. What, what I want you to do is I, is I want you to put one quarter in the offering at Sunday school, and the other quarter, hold on to it, because after church, we're going to take you to Lion's Choice. We're going to buy you one of those 25-cent coins, or cones, ice cream cones. You remember they used to be 15 cents inflation. So, you know, just hold on to that quarter, and we're going to buy you. So it's tithing like 50%. It's, it's terrific. And so the little boy was so excited. He was so excited, he got out of the car, and he's like, all right, a quarter to Sunday school, a quarter to Lion's Choice, a quarter to Sunday school. And he's just looking at the money. All of a sudden, as he's walking into church, like walking in through our parking lot, he drops one. And he follows it, it rolls, it rolls, it rolls. Finally, it rolls right into that little drainage sewage thing. And it just clunk at the very bottom. And he stares at it. And then he looks to heaven. He goes, God, there's your quarter right there. There, there it is. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> we have this tension that when, it, when the rubber meets the road... Oftentimes we think, God, I'll, I'll just give you what's left over because I want to make sure that I keep what's mine as mine. And we see that, that, that stewardship, stewardship is, is really about lordship. It's really about us making a decision to see ourselves, identify ourselves as stewards by God. Now, again, I, I know it doesn't feel that way because at the end of the week or two weeks, your name's on the paycheck not only is your name on the paycheck, but, but your name is on the title of the house, title of your car. Your name is on the loan as well, right? And if you miss a payment, you, wouldn't it be nice to say, you need to talk to God. He owns it all. <laughs> It'd be nice to do that, but that just doesn't work. They're not going to take that. They're not going to take that for an excuse. You, you think, God, I'm on the hook, and it's true. God has all the rights, and we have all the responsibility. And yet, even though we don't understand, God says, listen, I still want you to trust that I have more. I'm the owner with unlimited resources, and you're the steward. Manage the gifts that I have given you. The battle we face is real because we, we as the owner in our minds, with culture telling us that we're the owners, we want to say what's mine is mine. When God says be a steward and begin to think what's mine is really God's. As owners, we want to say I can use my resources however I want. And God says no, think like a steward that you should Use God's resources, these resources, to advance my priorities. As owners, I often think, I'm, account I'm not accountable to anyone for how I use my money, my resources, my relationships. And a steward thinks, I will give an account to God one day for how I use the resources and the relationships that he's placed on my path. It's a retooling of the way we think. It's challenging that assumption that we're owners when we're actually managers, we're stewards. And I know for, for us... Old habits die hard. Old habits die hard in a lot of different areas. When we sold our house, you know, we moved in on Monday. On Tuesday, we had an elders meeting. Wednesday night, we had church here again for midweek. And two nights in a row, as I'm driving back, I found myself three quarters of the way going back to St. Charles instead of Ferguson. I was driving over Creve Corps Bridge before I realized, I don't live here anymore. <laughs> I got to get back on 270 and head on Head on up the road. Could you imagine if I got all the way to the door? <laughs> Just kind of backing away, right? Could be kind of dangerous. Old habits are hard to break. They die hard. And so I want to share just a couple of things that can help re remind ourselves that we're, we're stewards, we're not owners. The first thing is this, is 
to keep transferring ownership mentally in our mind and our hearts and our spirits, keep transferring that ownership over to God. Whatever comes our way, whatever we see in our possession, understand that it's temporarily placed in our possession, a car, a house, whatever it is, understand that it really does belong to God and, and say it out loud, God, this belongs to you. I just moved into a house and I have to tell myself, I have to tell myself, especially moving out of the house, this wasn't mine, Lord, this is yours, and now I'm moving on. And this is true for this house, too. It's not mine, Lord, it's yours. And I want to think of ways, God, that we can glorify you with this house, with this car. Like I said, I, I was blessed to see people living this out with their time and their resources, their, their help. This past week, on Saturday, we had this, this is the first crew. On Saturday, we had this amazing crew, 25, 30 people showed up at different intervals to help us move out. And it was really blessed. We had this 26-foot U-Haul that was packed, but also on top of that, I saw, I saw a friend bring a truck. We loaded all of our house plants in the back of his truck. Had another friend, Aaron Guest, brought um, a trailer for a motorcycle. And Danny Nelson, Danny Nelson, who, who owns this thing called Amazing Trailers, um, blessed us, our family, with these brand new trailers to be able to utilize these trailers, a 16-footer and a 12-footer to pack up all our stuff. So we had all of our stuff in, in trucks and trailers and this 26-foot 26, 26 U-Haul, and it was a blessing. So we moved out on Saturday. We got to move in on Monday. Here's the second crew. Here's the second crew. It was, it was such, such a blessing. And, and what I realized was with their time and with their talents and with their resources, all of these individuals realized, even though they were in possession of it, they were using it to serve. I was the glad recipient of their grace and generosity. And it was very blessed. And so thank you. Thank you, Danny. I'm sorry for the dent that got put in the trailer that you lent me. So I really feel bad about that. Awful. But I was the glad recipient. These are people that understand that we need to keep transferring ownership to God because the truth is God gives and he sure can. If we hold tightly to it, God can just say, how about I just remove that from you? Because you're holding too tightly to something that seems to be between you and me, an obstacle for us to draw near to one another. God can take away. I, I said we, we moved out on Saturday. We moved in on, on Monday. Between that, we still were able to live in an empty house. And um, on Monday morning, we showed up at 9 o'clock at the title company, and we were able to sign the papers. And so by 11, we were done, and I had officially sold my house in Summerfield, in, in, in St. Charles on Summerfield Drive. Um, the other house didn't close <laughs> till, till like 1.30, 2 o'clock. And so there was a time when I, my house was sold and I hadn't purchased a house and for like two and a half hours, I was homeless. <laughs> right? all, all of our stuff was on the church parking lot. Some of you saw that last, last week. You saw a big U-Haul, that was us. It was just sitting on the parking lot for, for, for two and a half hours. Me and my daughters, my wife, we were, we were homeless. And listen, I know that's like first world problems, thinking I'm homeless that way. But it, it felt weird. Like, what if something went wrong on the other side of them selling us a house? And where would, where would we go? I guess we just set up shop here at Gateway, right? Where would we go? And it was a weird feeling. It was a, a place where it put me, even in that two and a half hours, it put me in a place of dependency on God. God, make this go through. Please, Lord. Because God gives and God takes away, and he can, if we hold too tightly to the things that, that interrupt our relationship with God. With him, So we need to keep transferring ownership over to the Lord. And the second thing, and this is, this is huge. I mean, really, this is, you know, walk away with this more than anything else. When you think about living generously, walk away with this. To recognize that generosity helps people to see Jesus. You want to get out of the way? You want people to see Christ high and lifted up? Then become generous. Be a person of, of generosity. I admire, I, I respect, I'm inspired by people who are generous. And I, and I want to emulate them. I want to become, it translates in the church and outside of the church. It translates to people when we're generous. And it sets the foundation for us to be able to share the goodness of Jesus Christ beyond what he can provide, beyond, beyond the relationship he can establish. It helps us to share the gospel with them that can save them. And listen, the gospel finds itself grounded in this beauty of generosity, amen? Th think about it. Christ, Christ giving, Christ coming, Christ dying on a cross, laying down his life, pouring himself out for us. It is, 
It is the greatest picture of generosity we could ever hope to imagine or to attain. It is the greatest example of generosity. The divine supernatural God becoming incarnate to sacrifice his life on our behalf. The Apostle Paul, he, he understood this. When he was on behalf of the Jerusalem church, when he was traveling, traveling through the churches, and he came to Corinth, he was trying to reach them to get them to give in order that people during a famine and a, and a drought could be fed. Paul appeals to the greatest example in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8, verse 9, in the New Rise Standard Version, he says, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, think of that. Think of the, the cross. You know it. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And really, really when the church in the first century began to live out that kind of generosity, people said, this is uncommon. This is uncanny. And they were attracted. They flooded themselves to the cause of, of Christ and Christianity because they, they saw them doing things that nobody else was doing. And they didn't just do works. They, they did works, but then they preached the gospel to accompany those works so people would not only be saved in this lifetime or rescued in this lifetime, but they would be rescued for eternity, for all eternity. God has for us, God has for us this desire for us to live generously. And he wants people to see Jesus and he knows that, that most often when we're sacrificial and, and we're living that life of generosity, we kind of get out of our own way and people see a, a pure, beautiful picture of Christ and, and the gospel. There's some keys that we believe are important, and we hope, we hope that through this series, you can begin to pick up these keys and, and see these principles that help us to understand how to live generously. It was, it was Sunday night, the trucks and the trailers, they were all up here at church. All that was left in our driveway was my, my truck, which was loaded up with the last minute stuff from the garage, cleaning supplies that we had finished cleaning. We were doing the final wipe downs on Sunday night so we can get up on Monday morning and just be completely out of the house. And as, as Carrie was cleaning out the refrigerator, we were filling up you know, our trash cans, our trash bins for the last time. I had one trash bin in the back of my truck and Carrie was emptying out the, the freezer of all of our frozen goods and we were just gonna, gonna toss them. And so I grabbed the bag and I went over and it was, it was pretty heavy, so I set down my truck bed, got on top of my truck bed, and then I, and I threw it in the, the trash bin that was on my truck. And, and then around 10.45, I thought, I, I think I'd like to reorient and move my truck around. And so I was looking for my keys. And I, I couldn't find my keys anywhere. Now, I started to panic a little bit, but I thought they must be around somewhere. So I went inside and, and I looked around. The house was completely empty and super clean. So they were going to be really out in the open, but I, I couldn't find them. 10, 1045 turned into 1050. I can't find my keys. And see, see, it's a problem. The problem was not only my truck keys, but on the key ring are these three master keys, master lock keys that, 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 held, that held all of my stuff in trailers and in trucks right up here at Gateway Christian Church. Everything that I thought I possessed was locked down, literally locked down behind gates and doors within those trucks, and I couldn't find my keys anywhere. Those three master keys, I, I couldn't find them anywhere. And I'm just panicking. 10.50, 11 o'clock, look around. I need to do a little more praying and a little less panicking, but I was panicking, thinking, okay, Lord, where, where, where are they? And um, apparently I, I have them, so I... What I discovered was, what I discovered was, is when I set down the trash bag on the back of my truck bed, my keys were sitting there, it poked a hole, and I lifted the trash bag and threw the trash bag in one of the bins. So we were actually, for a half hour, we were sifting through trash trying to find my keys. Because I knew, I knew the keys unlocked all of the things that God had gifted, gifted me with and our family with for the last 14 years. And I wanted to be able to to get those and be able to move to the place that he, he has destined us and designed us to be, our new place, our new home. I want to say, there, there's some of you here, some of you here need to do some digging, do some principles and some soul searching to say, God, I, I know there's some keys that, are, that maybe I've you know, lost, I've not paid attention to, that, that I know, Father God, can unlock some things in my life and my relationship so I can be a better steward to 
my wife, my husband, my children, there's some keys here. And I, I pray that this month you begin to think through those keys that can unlock blessings for relationship and blessings for, um, for your family. You might have to do some digging, but it's okay. The hard work's needed and necessary. Some of you need to unlock this key. The master has a key for you to unlock relationship with him. And maybe that's where you need to start. It is where you need to start. If you don't know Jesus this morning, we would pray. We pray that you would take a first step saying, I I want a relationship with Christ. I know he designed me, he made me, and I'm ready to yield my life to the one who died and gave everything to rescue me. And I'd love, I'm here. I've got another pastor in the front row, which is not always common. I've got Brock Howard. He's also a minister, pastor. He'd be happy to pray with you too. So me me and Brock, if you guys are interested in in coming up, we'd love to, to share with you how God loves you how Jesus died for you and how heaven waits for you. Would you stand as we pray and let us go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for helping us understand that you own everything, including us, and you call us to yourself. Lord, help us to reevaluate how we are to live as stewards and managers of not only the resources, Lord, but, but Lord, more importantly, the relationships that you have placed in our life. Help us to think through the words our actions, what we do with our bodies, Lord, and to think if we really are glorifying you with any of those, with our words, with our actions, with our bodies, and that, Lord, maybe it's time to turn it over to you as the owner and allow you to have your way. Father, thank you for this time that we shared. Speak to us now, and and I pray, Father God, like in the old days, in the old days in the book of Acts, Lord, where you just unleashed your generosity, and it was seen, it was seen through the lives of of people all around and people were just flooding towards the cross because they saw it tangible and palpable in people's lives. I pray, Father, that you would do that again. Do that again in our lives. Do that again in our church. Do that again in St. Louis, Father. We pray in Christ's mighty name and all God's people said, amen.